Module 5. So in this module, we're going to start zooming out just a little bit and start understanding a little bit more about large-scale weather patterns. And the first main component of a large-scale weather pattern is wind. And so for this module, we're going to be talking about why the wind blows. Um, and this module's lectures are split, split up into three. The first one is going to be talking about air pressure. The second one's going to be talking about what's called the pressure gradient force, how that develops, um, how we go from no wind to wind in the first place. And then the third lecture will be talking about other forces that act on the wind. And we'll hopefully then put together a tapestry, uh, an idea of all the different factors that influence our wind. Now, I don't know about you, but wind does have an impact on my life. Um, whether it is blowing heavily when I'm driving or creating turbulence when I'm flying or, um, or if you've ever worn something that was a little loose and the wind was blowing and it, it moved things around. Um, other people have been impacted by scarier things related to the wind, such as trees being blown over or roofs being ripped off of houses. Um, some of the most severe weather that we experience here on Earth is related mainly to high winds. Um, things like hurricanes and tornadoes are gigantic areas of high winds. So we're going to be talking a little bit about wind in this module. And then in the next few modules, we'll start talking more about large-scale weather circulations and how what we're learning in this module relates to that. So let's jump in and start talking. Um, so before we can really understand what wind is, we need to talk a little bit about air pressure. Now we've talked about air pressure briefly when we first introduced the atmosphere and talked a little bit about some of the main features of the atmosphere, but now we're going to delve in a little bit deeper into this topic. So the goals for this first lecture are to understand what air pressure is, understand how air pressure is measured, so how we're able to measure air pressure, what some of the earliest um, instruments for measuring air pressure were, and um, then I'll talk briefly about some of the instruments we have today, but um, just giving you the over idea, the overarching idea of how air pressure is measured. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how air pressure varies in the atmosphere and how to identify it on a weather map. So first, let's talk about what air pressure is. Well, it should be no surprise to you by this point that our atmosphere is composed of many different molecules, many different little pieces of matter. And each one of these pieces has a mass to it. And since it has a mass to it, it exerts weight on our bodies. And air pressure is simply the weight of the air above you. So believe it or not, right now, there is a certain amount of air weighing down on your body. And the average sea level air pressure, the average weight of sea level air pressure is 14.7 pounds of air per square inch. So what this means is that from the top of the atmosphere, the very, very top of the atmosphere, all the way down to sea level, all the molecules in there, if you were to bunch them all up, every square inch on the surface would have 14.7 pounds of air above it. So the air, the atmosphere is actually pretty heavy. Um, thankfully, our bodies are acclimated to this. And in fact, our bodies are very sensitive to changes in this. Um, if you've ever flown or if you've ever driven up Highway 17 or if you've ever been on BART before, um, BART's a train system here in the Bay Area. If you've ever been on that and gone into a tunnel, you may feel your ears pop. And the reason why that happens is when you experience those things, you're experiencing a pressure change. And so what's actually happening to your body is your body is readjusting to that pressure change. And so, yeah, our bodies are very sensitive to differences in air pressure. Um, now, with that said, we want to know a lot about air pressure. And, and hopefully in this module, you'll understand why air pressure is so important. 
because of this we want to measure it and since we're measuring it that means we want to have a number some kind of quantity that we can use to sum it up and so then we want to have a certain set of units and there are two main systems that are used for measuring air pressure two main units used the first set of units are the ones we use here in the United States and these are called inches of mercury and I'll explain more where this term comes from in a few minutes inches of mercury and the average sea level pressure so we're talking about the pressure at sea level in inches of mercury is 29.92 inches of mercury so 29.92 inches of mercury anything higher than that is considered higher than average anything lower than that is considered lower than average however this particular unit is not commonly used elsewhere and it's really not used by meteorologists the unit that is used by meteorologists and the unit that I really want you to know actually I want you to know both of these but the unit we're mainly going to be working with in this module is what's called the millibar the millibar is the standard unit of air pressure that is used by meteorologists. Um, it's also referred to as what are called hectopascals. Um, we're not going to focus so much on that term. We're going to focus on millibars. And the average sea level pressure in millibars is 1013.25 millibars. Now just a quick disclaimer, I want you to know both of these numbers and I want you to know their units. So I want you to know average sea level pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury and that it's 1013.25 millibars. Um, it's, it's the same quantity, it's just two different units, just, just like dollars and cents. If I have one dollar, I have a hundred cents. I have the same amount of money, it's just two different units. Well here, this is the same amount of pressure, but in two different units. So make sure you know both of these numbers. Now, with that said, what about this whole inches of mercury thing? Well, the term inches of mercury actually comes from how air pressure was originally measured. Well, air pressure is measured using an instrument called a barometer. And there are many different types of barometers that can be used. Um, some are gigantic, some can fit in the palm of your hand and air pressure is measured using one of these barometers. The original barometer was invented by somebody named Evangelista Torricelli. He's actually a student of Galileo Galilei, um, the man that perfected the telescope and saw Jupiter's first four moons and um, did some other really cool things. Um, so Torricelli was one of his students and Torricelli created the first barometer. And the reason why we use this term inches of mercury is his barometer used mercury. And the way that it worked was that you had this pool of mercury at the surface, at the bottom of this barometer, and then this long tube that sticked out in the middle. And the idea was, was that as air was weighing down on this pool of mercury, it was forcing it up into the tube. And so the greater the pressure, the higher the mercury would rise. So the greater the pressure, the higher the mercury would rise. And what Torselli found was that it rose approximately 30 inches into the tube. And the average sea level pressure shown on one of these barometers would result in mercury rising up 29.92 inches. So just about 30 inches. And this is where that whole inches of mercury thing comes from. It comes from Torricelli's original barometer. Now we don't usually use these kind of barometers anymore because these kind of barometers are toxic because mercury is toxic. Um, there are other fluids that we can use that are very similar to mercury but don't have the toxicity different and types of alcohols, water alcohol solutions. Um, but most barometers today are actually measured using a coil of wire that then either lengthens or shrinks due to changes in pressure. 
And this is actually how we measure pressure using anything. We, we find something that is sensitive to a change in pressure, and then we measure how that something changes. And some barometers are really giant. Like if you think about this particular mercury barometer, um, this thing is, so right now we have a height of 29.92 inches. So I would assume that this particular this particular tube is probably around 35, 36 inches. That's about three feet tall. And then the pool of mercury at the bottom, that adds a little bit of mass to it. So this is a pretty big instrument. This isn't something that you can just fit into your pocket. Luckily, many barometers nowadays can fit into your pocket pretty easily. An important fact that I want you to know about air pressure is that air pressure decreases as you rise in the atmosphere. Make sure you understand that. Make sure you have that written down, double underlined in red if you have to. But air pressure decreases as you rise in the atmosphere. And this is actually pretty self-explanatory. Um, air pressure is the weight of the air above you. Well, the higher you rise up in the atmosphere, the less atmosphere you're going to have above you. If you are at sea level and then you rise one mile above the surface, now you have one mile less above you. Hence, you would have lower air pressure. But air pressure also has another interesting fact to it. Not only does it decrease, it actually, de it actually decreases what we call exponentially. And exponentially is just a fancy term for a huge change as you rise above the surface right near the bottom of the earth or right, sorry right near the surface of the earth and then smaller and smaller changes the higher up you rise and the reason why this happens is air pressure behaves very similar to a pyramid so if you take a look at this pyramid here with um, these different cheerleaders on it the pyramid or the the lowest level of this pyramid has three cheerleaders. The second level has two, and then the top level has one. Well, air molecules behave the same way. Most of the atmosphere's air molecules are crowded near the surface of the Earth. Hence, most of the air is down here. Most of the air is down here. As you rise up, not only is there less air above you, but there are fewer air molecules at a given height. Just like there are fewer cheerleaders as you rise in height, there are fewer air molecules as you rise in height. And so this creates an exponential decrease in air pressure with height. And this, this decrease is actually very easily noticed. Um, believe it or not, even though the atmosphere is over 300 miles thick, the atmosphere is over 300 miles thick. Most of the atmosphere's molecules, 99% of them, actually lie within the first 20 miles. So think about this really tall block, 300 miles tall. The first 20 miles at the bottom of it have 99% of the atmosphere's molecules. And hence, just like with the cheerleader analogy, most of it is at the bottom. There's much less at the top. One of the things I should mention, though, is air pressure doesn't just change with height. It can also change horizontally. And, and horizontally means from just one location on the surface to another location on the surface. So right now, as I'm recording this lecture, I'm in Cupertino, California. Um, about 10 miles west of San Jose, and there's very little elevation change between here and San Jose. But what if I told you that the air pressure here in Cupertino can be different than the air pressure in San Jose? So yeah, air pressure also changes horizontally. And this is important because this creates locations of high air pressure and locations of low air pressure. And these areas of high and low pressure act as weather makers. So we really care about them. And the reason why these act as weather makers is in high pressure, air is usually sinking. 
And sinking air doesn't allow for clouds to form, it doesn't allow for rain to occur, so usually there's no rain around high pressure. On the other hand, around low pressure, you have air that's rising. And as air rises, it expands, cools, and condenses. We get clouds and we get rain. So we want to know where high pressure is and where low pressure is, because that's going to tell us a lot about the kind of, the we the kind of weather that is occurring at that particular location. With that said, why, do, why does pressure change horizontally? Well, pressure changes horizontally due to changes in temperature. There's actually a law called the Ideal Gas Law. And in the recommended textbook, it explains a little bit about the law. But let me just briefly show you the equation here, and then I could talk about it for a second. So the equation looks something like this. Pressure times volume equals the number of molecules in the atmosphere, a constant, R, and then T, temperature. And the idea actually is, is that pressure and temperature are directly related to each other. An increase in pressure results in an increase in temperature. A decrease in pressure results in a decrease in temperature. Assuming that volume and the number of molecules remain constant, an increase in pressure results in an increase in temperature. Um, and we'll talk more about this in the next lecture. And, and, and this is also a little bit beyond the scope of our class. But I do just want you to know that horizontal changes in air pressure are caused by horizontal changes in air temperature. If you increase one and leave everything else the same, the other increases. With that said, we really care about knowing where high pressure and low pressure are on our planet. And one of the ways that we can do this is we can make observations of air pressure over many different locations and then plot them on a map. Now there's one tricky thing about this. Earth's surface isn't flat. I mean, if you live here in Silicon Valley where I'm recording this lecture, um, it's pretty obvious if you look around in almost any direction that you see mountains. Yeah, there are plenty of mountains around here. And this is true for the entire Earth. I mean, there's different elevations, different heights. But if you remember, as I said a moment ago, air pressure decreases as you rise in the atmosphere. So if you are higher in the atmosphere, if you're at a higher elevation, you're going to experience lower air pressure. This adds a little bit of confusion when talking about sea level pressure, surface pressure, high and low pressures. And as meteorologists, this makes our job a little bit more difficult. So these mountains, hills, we also have valleys, places like Death Valley, which is located um, below sea level, um, different basins, basically like giant topographic bowls. Um, these all have different elevations and have different average pressures and so on. Well, because of this, if we took the effects of elevation into account, we wouldn't be able to identify locations of high pressure and low pressure. Essentially, we would see something that looks like this right here. And basically what you would get is you would get low pressure over mountaintops, and you would get high pressure closer to sea level. And these pressure differences are only due to elevation. They have nothing to do with rising air, sinking air, weather systems, or anything like that. So what we as meteorologists actually do, what we as meteorologists actually do is we actually get rid of these elevation differences. We get rid of them. And instead, we calibrate all pressure readings to sea level. 
we calibrate all pressure readings to sea level. So with that said, this, that gives us two different types of air pressure. We have what's called sea level pressure. That's the pressure that the location would have if it was calibrated to sea level. And then we have station pressure. Station pressure is the actual pressure at that location. Well, as meteorologists, we take all of these station pressures and we calibrate them to sea level. And this allows us to then identify, okay, what locations are experiencing higher than average pressures? What locations are experiencing lower than average pressures? And what we end up with is a map that looks something like this. That looks something like this. So what we've done here is we have essentially flattened the entire United States. We've taken away any topography, any, any topographic influences on air pressure, and we've calibrated all of our pressure levels to sea level. And what this has done is this has allowed us to identify, okay, where are pressures higher and where are pressures lower? Now let me talk a little bit about how this weather map works. So we actually plot pressure on a weather map using a series of what are called isobars. An isobar just simply means a line of constant pressure. Iso means same, bar means barometric, talking about pressure. So what that means is, uh, let's take a look at one of these lines. Let's take a look at this line here. This line represents 1,008 millibars. And what's actually happening is, as you travel on this line, the air pressure stays at 1,008 millibars. It stays at 1,008 millibars. Meanwhile, meanwhile, over here, air pressure is 1,004 millibars. Up here, air pressure is 1,000 millibars. Okay, so this can actually help us identify air pressure patterns. That's important because we want to know where high pressure and where low pressure is. Now what about regions in between these two lines? Like let's pick a region right here. So let's say halfway between 1004 and 1008. Well, assuming that that location is exactly halfway between 1008 and 1004, it would have an air pressure exactly halfway between the, those two. So that would be approximately 1000 sorry for my terrible handwriting on this thing, 1,006 millibars. 1,006 millibars. And let's suppose you continue traveling in this direction. Air pressure is going to continue to decline. So 1,008, 1,007, 1,006, 1,005, 1,004. And then over here, 1,003, 1,002, 1,001, and then 1,000. Okay. Now what I want you to actually really focus on on this map though is these two bullseyes. So we have a bullseye here and a bullseye here. And to identify if the bullseye represents high pressure or low pressure, start on the exterior of the bullseye. So go outside of the bullseye and begin to travel towards the center. What are the isobar values doing as you travel towards the center? Well, in the case of high pressure, as you travel towards the center, these numbers become higher. So first you started out here, then you crossed 1,012, then you crossed 1,016, and then 1,020. And then everything inside this isobar or everything inside this bullseye is higher than 1,020. And so this is high pressure. On the other hand, let's say you start at the same location, but let's now head towards this other bullseye. Rather than crossing 1,012, you cross 1,008, then 1,004, then 1,000, then 996. What's happening in this case is air pressure values are declining 
as you head towards the center. That represents low pressure. That represents an area of low pressure. And so as meteorologists, what we do is we take these maps, we look for the bullseyes, and then we look for what the pressure is doing as you approach the center of it. And then that tells us where high pressure and low pressure are. One other thing I want to mention here is if you notice the difference from one isobar to the next consecutive isobar is eight millibars, or sorry, four millibars, I lied. Four millibars. That's what's called a con or sorry, that's what's called a contour interval. Or just a difference between two consecutive isobars. And typically these lines are drawn at four millibar intervals. That means that the difference between one and the next consecutive is four. So a thousand and eight and then a thousand and four. Or a thousand and eight and then a thousand and twelve. And so on. The map I just showed you was showing you air pressure at sea level. But we also care about air pressure patterns higher in the atmosphere. And these are what are called upper level maps. Now upper level maps are a little bit different than surface maps. And the reason why is because rather than looking at a certain elevation on an upper level map, we actually look at a certain pressure level. So what we're actually looking at on this map here, this is what's called a 700 millibar map. And what this represents is this represents the location in the atmosphere where air pressure is 700 millibars. So we rise up into the atmosphere until we're at 700 millibars. And what you see here are these different lines. These different lines actually identify at what elevation is the air pressure 700 millibars. So for example, let's say I'm doing, let's say I launch a weather balloon here and it rises up to 700 millibars. Well, that 700 millibars is taking place at 5,820 meters above the surface. So at this location right here, the 700 millibar level, that height at which the pressure is 700 millibars, is at 5,820 meters. So the pressure is 700 millibars at 5,820 meters. Meanwhile, meanwhile, on the other hand, let's say I'm over here. This is near Cleveland, Ohio and I launch a weather balloon there, here the pressure is 700 millibars at 5,580 meters. So that's the height that the pressure is 700 millibars there. Now the reason why we use millibars for upper level, for upper level maps rather than constant elevations is certain features are present at different levels at different pressure levels in the atmosphere. Actually, this is a 500 millibar map. Sorry, blooper. This is a 500 millibar map. I lied. 700 millibar maps would usually be closer to 2,000, 2,500 meters. So this is a 500 millibar map. So at this location, air pressure is 500 millibars at 5,820 meters. At this location, air pressure is 500 millibars at 5,580 meters. Now, what does this actually tell us? Well, this tells us that the 500 millibar level is higher down here than it is over here. And this actually helps us identify locations of the jet stream and more specifically, the location of what are called troughs and ridges. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Whenever you see a trough, whenever you see a trough, like right here, 
These actually represent areas of cold air. And the reason why is because cold air sinks, hence that 500 millibar level sinks. And so wherever you see troughs, and these usually occur whenever you notice, well these do occur, when you notice a downward kink in these, in these contour lines. So you notice a downward kink there, and then you also notice a downward kink over here. Those are troughs. On the other hand, wherever there's warm air, warm air rises. That pushes the 500 millibar level higher in the atmosphere. And what you'll notice is an upward kink in the lines on the map. An upward kink. We're going to talk more about troughs and ridges in the next module when we talk about the jet stream. But just for now, know that troughs occur whenever these lines kink downwards, whenever they, um, whenever they turn downwards like this, and then ridges whenever they turn upwards. And the reason why this happens again is because when you have warm air, warm air rises. That causes the 500 millibar level to rise. Meanwhile, cold air sinks. This causes the 500 millibar level to sink. And so wherever you see ridges, that represents an area of warm air. Wherever you see troughs, that represents an area of cold air. And again, we'll talk more about that in the next module when we talk about global circulation and we talk about the jet stream. Now the, lex the next lecture, we're going to start talking about how these differences in pressure create differences in wind.